as i welcome on behalf of the institute all those who have joined us in today's webinar on the cessation of east pakistan why states break up we have four speakers in the webinar and each speaker will have about 20 minutes and then there will be a question and answer session before we close the first speaker is dr masuma hassan chairperson of the pakistan institute of international affairs which is the oldest think tank in pakistan and president of orit foundation the leading women's empowerment organization in our country formerly she was pakistan's cabinet secretary permanent representative at the united nations in vienna at the international atomic energy agency unedo the crime prevention and criminal justice outfit and ambassador to austria slovenia and slovakia she will speak on the fall of dhaka on 16 december 1971 need for introspection thank you can everybody hear me yes madam i don't think anyone can you be can i be heard yes ma'am you are yes. audible okay okay well i want to add my words of welcome in addition to those just spoken by bushra to all those who have joined us today as well as uh, our speakers sonia biserko james mixi and sharuk sharawans next year in the year 2021 it will be 50 years since dhaka fell on 16 december 1971 after the civil war in east pakistan pakistan disintegrated and bangladesh became an independent state in historical terms enough time has elapsed for us to introspect and ask why pakistan fell apart most of all because most of the material about the event is now available recently there has been attempts to correct the narrative from pakistan's point of view the first question which comes to mind is about the fighting capability of pakistan's armed forces that many commanders did not surrender even after the decision to surrender was announced some officers disappeared and we can only assume that they died fighting it is interesting to note however what the enemy had to say about this issue dk palit the lightning campaign the indo pakistan war 1971 he has asserted that it is wrong to assume that there was a general collapse of pakistan's armed forces about the battle of hilly he has written and i quote from him the pakistani garrison virtually had to be annihilated before the post could be taken whenever the pakistanis decided to hold out they fought ferociously indeed it would be correct to say that whenever the pakistanis were fighting from prepared positions they fought with grim determination but a greater tribute was paid by the chief of the indian army general sam manikshaw later he became field marshal and i quote the pakistani army in east pakistan fought very gallantly but they had no chance they were a thousand miles away from their base i had got 8 or 9 months to make my preparations 
I had a superiority of almost 50 to 1. They just had no chance, but they fought very gallantly. Another concern is about the casualties suffered by the Bengalis in East Pakistan. When Mujibur Rahman, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, was uh, released from a Pakistani prison after Dhaka fell, he did not fly straight to Dhaka. He flew to London. And in a British RAF jet, he flew from London to Delhi. At Delhi airport, he was received by the Indian President Giri, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, the entire Indian cabinet, and all the service chiefs. And from there, in the same RAF jet, he flew to Dhaka to a tumultuous welcome at Tejgao airport. There was a sea of people. And there he declared that the Bengalis had lost 3 million dead and more than 200,000 women were raped. Now, as we all know, casualty figures are always estimates. Nobody actually counts the dead. And there was in that chaos, no system for registering rapes. On the other hand, the Humudur Rahman Commission, about which I will speak later also, writes about this issue. So much damage the justices wrote could not have been done by the entire strength of the Pakistan army, then stationed in East Pakistan, even if it had nothing else to do. So you have a choice between 300,000 dead and 26,000 dead, which the general headquarters figures were given out during the army action. But this insistence on 3 million dead has continued without any credible evidence, actually. And also because there has been no reference in Bangladesh to the Awami League's civil disobedience movement in which thousands of non-Bengalis were slaughtered by the Mukti Bahini and the Sangram Parishad. That was the militant wing of the Awami League. Again, with respect to the number of uh, military personnel who laid down their arms, there has been an insistence that 93,000 military personnel laid down their arms, but this is really not true because less than half of them were from the armed forces, about 42,000. And as we know, large armies have surrendered throughout history. But while all these may be legitimate concerns, Really, the most important question is, why did Pakistan fall apart at all? I believe the primary reason was Pakistan's unique geographical configuration. Two wings, as we used to call them, separated by 1,000 miles of unfriendly India, which became aggressive and even more unfriendly and interventionist during the civil war, with the added anomaly that the less privileged wing, that is East Pakistan, was also the territory where the majority of the population lived. Imagine a situation in which there was geographical contiguity between East and West Pakistan. I'm sure that in that case, the feeling of alienation which developed in East Pakistan would never have become so intense. And it would also have been far easier to use for successfully. We can take a leaf from the Nigerian civil war, which raged during the 1960s, where the Igbo people succeeded, seceded, and they created their own state of Biafra, which had the support of important countries like China and West Germany and many other European states. But Biafra was compelled back into Nigeria, though at great cost, about 100,000 military casualties and about 1 million dead of starvation. The second factor which facilitated the secession of East Pakistan was its feeling of vulnerability, especially in matters of defense, which peaked during the India-Pakistan War of 1965 during which the people of East Pakistan felt particularly unprotected. 
But this vulnerability was voiced almost from the beginning in all discourse, in their meetings, meetings of political parties, students' unions, for as you know, the students were in the vanguard of the freedom movement in, in East Pakistan, in their committees of action and conventions, and especially by East Pakistan's representatives in the debates in Pakistan's constituent assemblies. They often hinted, especially if economic discrimination was not stopped, that there would be a parting of ways. Somebody should have listened. Sheikh Mujibur Rahman did not pull out his six points from his hat all of a sudden. They had been, the substance of the six points had been evolving over many years. What did he actually want? The six points demanded a federation in accordance with the Lahore Resolution, full provincial autonomy for all the provinces, elections on the basis of adult franchise, that the federation should deal only with defense and foreign affairs, that the power of taxation and revenue collection should be with the provinces, that East Pakistan should have a separate military or paramilitary force, and that the naval headquarters should be located in East Pakistan. He announced these six points in a meeting of opposition parties in Lahore in February 1966. They were rejected by all parties. They were considered as a conspiracy, a secessionist conspiracy in West Pakistan. And he stormed out of the meeting. Mujib and 34 others were tried for treason in the Agartala conspiracy case by Yu Khan in June 1968 by a military court in Dhaka Cantonment. But so successful was the agitation against this trial that they were released unconditionally a few months later. He was given the title of Banga Bandhu. And on 5 December 1969, in a mammoth public meeting in Paltan Maidan, he declared that East Pakistan would be called Bangladesh. The last reason I would like to advance was the failure or should I say the unwillingness of the civil and military leadership of Pakistan to understand and recognize the nature and intensity of Muslim and Bali nationalism. They were slighted, for instance, because Bengali was not used on the currency and stamps of Pakistan. They were slighted because East Pakistan's representatives were not being allowed to speak in Bengali in the Constituent Assembly. But far more, it was manifest in the language movement led by the students of Dhaka University. It was called Bahasha Andolan. Andolan means protest. For the recognition of Bengali as a national language of Pakistan. In 1952, there were extreme protests and rallies and agitation continued until Bengali was finally given the status with Urdu as Pakistan's national language in the constitution of 1956. But many lives had been lost. And the 21st of February, 1952 is still commemorated in Bangladesh. In fact, in 1999, UNESCO declared this day as the International Mother Language Day. Above all, there was this perception, this perception had developed that West Pakistan was somehow allergic to the use of the word Bengal. If there could be a Punjab, a Sindh, a Balochistan, why couldn't East Pakistan be called Bengal, which had a history and tradition of its own, Sheikh Mujib Rahman asked. Why could they not accept the word Bengal, he asked, except when they referred to the Bay of Bengal. Led by Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the Awami League declared independence for East Pakistan after it became clear that the government of the generals in Pakistan would not ask and invite Mujibur Rahman to form the government at the center 
although the Awami League had won the 1970 election, hands down beneath Pakistan and with a majority in the national elections at the center. One final question. Can the secession of East Pakistan have been prevented? Of course, it could have been avoided. But in the last stages of this tragedy, it would have resulted in a far different Pakistan from the one we had known. All our friends abroad, the United Nations, some politicians in West Pakistan, not all, all of them, had pleaded for a political solution, not, not a military solution to the problem. As we know, the military options led to Indian intervention, which sealed the fate of the United Pakistan. India invaded Pakistan on the 23rd of November, 1971. They say that day was Eid al-Fitr. We can now ask the question, what about accountability? Who was responsible? In fact, I think all parties were responsible. There were widespread protests and rallies throughout Pakistan after the fall of Trump, asking, clamoring for accountability. But the ultimate accountability came in the Humud Rahman Commission report. Immediately after he became or he was sworn in as president in 1971, December, Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto appointed a commission to inquire into the 1971 war. It was headed by Chief Justice Humudur Rahman with Justices Anwarul Haq and, and the family of the Rahman as members. The commission interviewed people from all walks of life, members of the public, political parties, personnel of the armed forces, the repatriated prisoners of war, prisoners of war, commanders, civil attorneys, Yahya Khan and his supporting generals, and General Niazi, commander in the Eastern Theater. As I have written in my memoirs, the Humudu Rahman Commission report has been criticized by many people who have never actually read it. It has been criticized for focusing on the military aspects of the war and not the political conditions in which East Pakistan succeeded. But that is not true because it does deal with the political aspect also. It analyzes each and every aspect of the war. It is a remarkable dark document and it sifts a monumental amount of evidence and material. It also issues a detailed charge sheet. It was de declassified on the 30th of December 2000 in its entirety except for some passages dealing with our foreign relations. At that time, I was the cabinet secretary and the cabinet division was the custodian of the report. There was some collateral damage. And that is that in many ghettoed and crowded camps in East Pakistan, a large number of Biharis, and they are called stranded Pakistanis, are still abiding. Very few of them have been given Bangladeshi citizenship. In the 1974 agreement between Pakistan and Bangladesh, Pakistan had accepted 170,000 Bihari refugees. And today, about 1.5 million illegal Bengalis live in Pakistan. In conclusion, let me say that Pakistan is not the only country in the world to have fallen apart. In known history, states have disintegrated. Even a superpower like the Soviet Union broke up in the last century, about which we will hear more from James Nixie. But in modern times, when war is not supposed to be the norm, although unfortunately it is, and where there are so many initiatives for peace. These events permanently blight the lives of the people of the generation in which they occur. 
and these tragedies scar the historical narrative for future generations. That is why it is so necessary to introspect because as Edmund Burke said, those who fail to learn from history are always destined to repeat it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Masuma, for your valuable input. The next speaker is Mr. James Nixie, who is director of the Russia and Eurasia program and of the Europe program at the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Chatham House, London. He is also an associate fellow at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. He has authored many scholarly works on Russia's relationship with other post-Soviet states and has written for leading newspapers such as The Guardian, Times, Independent, and Telegraph. His next co-authored publication is Myths and Fallacies Polluting the Western Policy Debate on Russia. He will address us on Does Russia Need Revolution to Change? Thank you. No, thank you very much indeed. Um, that's a very kind introduction and, uh, and a piece of marketing for my next publication. But um, let me just say what, an, what a real honor it is to be speaking to you here today. Thank you, Dr. Hassan, in particular, for the last 20 minutes in which I've learned an awful lot. Um, uh, and I very much hope we can find some commonalities between um, all of our presentations today. But again, I just want to say that this is a, this is a totally new experience for me speaking um, to this particular Institute of International Affairs, and I'm very honored um, uh, by your um, thoughtfulness. So I am indeed going to speak about um, a, a sort of a, a presentation of two parts, if you like. Uh, about, firstly, I will talk about the collapse of the Soviet Union and why I think it collapsed. And then I will bring us up to date a little bit and maybe um, ask why uh, the current regime in Russia has not collapsed so far and maybe what might happen in the future. But I won't spend, well, let's see how it goes, shall we? Um, you can all hear me, yes? Sorry, I'm just I'm not talking to a blank wall. Can you? Yeah, you can hear me. I'm getting nods. <laughs> okay. Sometimes I speak and uh, I go on for ages and I don't notice. Anyway, so I mean, I maintain that the. Um, years ago was the most significant geopolitical event of all of our lifetimes, geopolitical event, certainly since World War II. Um, it was, if you recall, of course, the Soviet Union, the largest country in the world. Uh, it covered almost a million square miles, a sixth of the Earth's surface, 300 million almost population, over 100 na different nationalities, uh, distinct nationalities. Um, and its sphere of influence extended, you know, right into what we now think of as being sort of Central Europe. And yet, well, we will discuss as to whether it collapsed overnight or whether it took, uh, whether it took 70 years. But what I would say is that all the signs were there that this was a system that was destined to uh, disintegrate. And yet, quite honestly, um, almost nobody foresaw it. It, we, I mean, we, we may say we did, we may look at it in hindsight and say it was always going to happen, but the reality is that at the time, when we think about Brezhnev's time or even Gorbachev's time back in the 1980s, is that nobody thought that this uh, superpower was coming to an end as soon as it did. Um, now, of course, <clears throat> as for all, as with all revolutions and, and all, all major changes, it's impossible to pinpoint a single cause uh, to uh, any event such as this especially something as far reaching as a dissolution of a superpower. But um, there were, in my opinion, uh, a number of internal and external factors which, which, which were at play, and I'll go through them quickly. Um, so, I mean, first of all, of course, there is a political factor. And quite clearly, Mikhail Gorbachev, still alive today, um, in his late, uh, early 90s now, um, then was a radically different general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union than anything we had ever seen beforehand. Um, he came to the general secretaryship of the Politburo in uh, 1985 uh, as a 55 year old man. And he was 54 and he was um, unlike anything anybody had ever seen. His predecessors, if you recall, Konstantin Chernyenko, Yuri Andropov um, were quite frankly, not to be meaning to be rude, pretty much dead when they, when they came into power. 
Uh, they lasted a year each. Brezhnev uh, was in power for 20 years himself, but really was in a coma for almost half of that, quite frankly. And so uh, Gorbachev brought uh, not only a much needed injection of youth uh, to the Soviet Union, but he also saw it as something which was morally and economically bankrupt and very much needed believed, um, along with his most significant advisors, Edvard Shevardnadze and Alexander Yakovlev, that the Soviet Union needed, needed radical change. And he did this through his policies, as you know, of glasnost, meaning openness, and perestroika, meaning restructuring, meaning that they wanted to foster dialogue and introduce sort of what we might think of as being sort of semi-free market reforms into the sort of the command economy system that they had. Um, and so uh, it must be said that Gorbachev was a communist, still is in so many ways a communist, um, and he did not himself want to see the dissolution of a Soviet Union. It was Boris Yeltsin who did that. But nonetheless, most uh, revolutions happen with the beginning of a, a sort of a, a liberalization, and it was undoubtedly Mikhail Gorbachev's radical differences to his predecessors which started that. And of course, what you began to see over time towards the end of the Soviet Union was uprisings elsewhere in the, the Soviet Union. Um, obviously, the, the Berlin Wall <laughs> falling is the most evident example of that and the fall of the Iron Curtain. Um, the Soviet Union followed just sort of two to three years behind that. Um, but even previous to that, of course, you have the solidarity movement in the United States. The Baltic states were taking concrete steps towards independence. And uh, before then, of course, you had efforts at it in, in, in Hungary and Czechoslovakia, which were put down, uh, which were put down uh, very strongly by the Soviet regime. So that's a political factor. Uh, obviously, I'm dealing with there's so much to be said on each of these topics. So you, I do apologize, of course, for the um, extreme brevity with which I'm covering all, all of these. I feel very, I feel very bad about that. The economic factor is uh, related to this, but the fact of the matter is, that although the Soviet economy was the largest economy. Um, in 19, uh, back in 19, or the second, what we'll say, it was the world's second largest economy back in 1990 by some measures. But at the end of the day, shortages of consumer goods were, had always been uh, routine, hoarding was, was commonplace, um, and the black market economy was over 10% of, 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 of the Soviet economy. Um, then, as now, it relied upon oil and natural gas um, in terms of exports to the Western world, such as it was. Um, but as you know, of course, the price of oil fell in, in, the, in the 1980s. It was about $120 a barrel back in 19, 1980. And by the mid, middle of that decade, it was down to $20, $20 a barrel. Um, so that, of course, shook them as, as well. And the you know, events bringing up the price of oil, such as the Iraqi war in 1990, couldn't, couldn't really shake that because by then, of course, the collapse of the Soviet Union was underway. So it was quite clear that although, again, uh, the, uh, so the, the effects of 70 years uh, of the command economy were, be, were, were, were beginning to, uh, were, were not beginning to bite because they had always been biting, but they had this incremental effect. And Gorbachev decided that he must change it before it changed them. Uh, I, again, there's much more can be said of these, and I hope that in the questions and discussion, if you're interested, of course, we can go into these in more detail, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on very quickly. The military factor was incredibly important as well, because what is very important is that although the Soviet Union had so many, uh, had so many economic problems, the military um, was immune or ring fenced from the, the cuts, if you like, and the budgetary fiscal austerity that the rest of the Soviet Union um, was forced to undergo. Military spending was always agnostic, if you like, of overall economic trends. So even when the Soviet economy lagged, the military remained a well-funded, albeit blunt, beast. Um, and of course, that is also unsustainable. Um, it managed, of course, to be successful, as it has done. The Russian, uh, the Russian um, military has achieved recent victories in Ukraine and Georgia, just as it did in putting down uprisings in Hungary and Czechoslovakia. But uh, it's, it's the, the, the need for the military to take priority, um, including research into and development, of course, science, technological innovations, which, of course, the Soviets have always been world class in. Um, also um, contributed to the overall weakening of the Soviet state. Um, linked to the um, military aspect is one particular element of that, and that, of course, is Afghanistan. Uh, obviously, that's 1979 to 89, roughly speaking, and this was also a key factor. The Soviet army, um, although uh, lionized, if you like, for its role in the Second World War, 
and its repression abilities that I've also already mentioned, it waded into this sort of graveyard of empires where everybody has, has been beaten back um, by the uh, American funded uh, uh, and American weaponized uh, Mujahideen were able to effectively you know, defeat uh, the, the Soviet army. And this, this again led to the sense that the power of the Soviet Union is not what it once was. And there were increasing um, internal opponents, not just to Gorbachev's reform efforts, but also to the, um, in, in terms of uh, opposition to what was happening in Afghanistan, but also uh, the idea that uh, this back-footed um, stalemate there um, was checking any advantage it, was, it, it, it had. Um, and uh, frankly, a lot of the soldiers who were fighting in those uh, conflicts in Afghanistan, you know, felt more kindred spiritness uh, to, say, the Central Asian republics um, and more religious ties to the Central Asian republics. So uh, the Russians' heart, as well as their soul, if you like, was never, was never really in it. But this failure in Afghanistan, a little like the failure in Vietnam for the Americans, um, fueled secessionist movements, which continued um, right up into 1990, particularly in uh, the South Caucasus and the Baltic states. Um, which, which, which moved sooner than anybody else. Um, next up is the social factor. Um, I mentioned earlier that liberalization started, uh, you know, a lot of this or, or hesitant liberalization. And, uh, you know, it's often said that in 1990, the first McDonald's opened in uh, Russia. I was actually there at the time <laughs> myself. Um, I didn't queue because the queue was about five miles long. Um, but it really was quite an opening up. And again, if you, you can't put the toothpaste back into the tube, and uh, it was, I'm not saying McDonald's itself is responsible for it in any, in any way, but the, the, incremental, uh, in the incremental beginnings of liberal newspapers, democratization, the recognition and admission that everything was, was rotten was a contributing factor to the fact that the, the, the people power was beginning to take hold and wanting something uh, different and Gorbachev was more responsive to that than any of his predecessors and not willing to put too much down although he did of course send some troops into the Baltic states in fact so it wasn't entirely bloodless the end of the, the end of the Cold War and the dissolution of the Soviet Union but um, I think that this big this sort of social factor whereby uh, a newly empowered citizenry um, led to again was a contributing factor to to, to this to, to this last to, to, the, to the ending of the last gasp of, a, of, a, of communism if you like um, uh, I think uh, the uh, a final uh, mention should be given to, well, and there's the two more, of course. Uh, one is the external factor in terms of uh, the United States and the incoming president there of Ronald Reagan. Reagan, unlike his predecessors, saw the Soviet Union as something to be dismantled, not something to be contained. So with his buildup of Star Wars, um, missile defense system, uh, in that year with his uh, uh, continual uh, never-ending speeches about how this must be done contributed to the Russian military unsustainable increase um, and uh, the combination of uh, Reagan and Gorbachev and Thatcher to an extent and Kohl being able to get on with each other and at the same time pushing them very hard on the military side forcing this, uh, forcing this arms race was a further factor. And finally, related to this is the nuclear factor, whereby, as I'm sure you remember or you're well aware, uh, there was a, a massive uh, nuclear explosion uh, in Pripyat uh, at the Chernobyl power station now in, nowadays in Ukraine in April 1986. It was almost a global catastrophe, I must add. But in fact, uh, it was the radioactive fallout um, as large as the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, quite frankly, um, which was contained, I mean, contained in certain, in so far as the information was still contained by the uh, Soviet legacy and mindset of, the, of, of, uh, of Gorbachev and his fellows at, at the time, uh, led again to the idea that not only was the Soviet Union sort of un, uh, unsustainable in and of itself, because it, it was a, a contributing factor to, 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 to this happening, be, the inability to, to, to run a tight ship. But it was more that the, what trust that remained in the Soviet system by 1986 was effectively shattered as the 
news of Chernobyl, the Chernobyl disaster um, got out. And Gorbachev said that um, he thought that um, the, the Chernobyl disaster was actually probably a more of a cause of the collapse of the Soviet Union, even than his own perestroika reforms. So those are just, I mean, I, 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 that is not an exhaustive list and it's certainly not in any way a detailed um, assessment of, of why the Soviet Union collapsed. I was once, uh, um, I was once asked by, well, I once asked Boris Nemtsov, the liberal politician murdered in the Kremlin Bridge some six years ago now, um, on why the Soviet, or whether the Soviet Union was unsustainable. He said it was unsustainable, yes, but it, um, but it was unsustainable for 70 years. Um, so, and of course, you know, not, not chronic ailments, if you like, are not necessarily fatal. Um, it, uh, so whilst in some ways it was doomed from birth, as, as all empires seem to be, um, it showed a remarkable degree of resilience, um, despite such an unwieldy and unsophisticated framework as it had, headed up by very old men, and in one case, a, a murderous psychopath who weren't ruled for 30 years by, by fear. Um, then uh, it, it, I, am, I am continue to be impressed, if you like, rather than uh, admire, but by the, by, the, by the ability of the Soviet Union and for states in general um, not to fail. Um, so what happened next? I mean, very briefly, um, then, as you all know, the 1990s came and we thought, most people thought again, that the situation was improving, that uh, although Russia was wild and uh, uh, difficult to govern, that Boris Yeltsin's heart was in the right place, that he was instinctively democratic, um, and that for all its teething troubles, that Russia was on the right track, albeit two steps forward and one step back. That is what most people thought. I was living in the 1990s uh, in Russia myself back then, and certainly there was a sense of uh, hope um, alongside the disgust uh, of the corruption uh, and the rottenness that was still there and, and, and the Soviet legacy as, as well. Um, and in, even in the early 2000s, when Putin came to power, uh, on, the, on the eve of 1999 to be precise, uh, we all, I think a lot of people understood or at least conceded that uh, any slight tightening was understandable and justifiable in order to steady the very wonky, the very uh, leaky, uh, Russian ship. Uh, after all, most people are willing to give new leaders the benefit of the doubt for a few years anyway. And that, of course, was another mistake. Um, because increasingly, but from the very start, in fact, we have come to understand that Putin, Putin's Russia uh, wanted something very antithetical to the rules-based system uh, of sovereign states. He did not accept the collapse of the Soviet Union. He famously said, I'm sure this is, uh, this is a bit of a cliche now, that the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of a 20th century was a fall of the Soviet Union, and he did not accept the sovereignty of the other um, of the other 13 successor states of the Soviet Union. Um, I mean, the five Central Asian states, the three South Caucasus states, Ukraine, Belarus, uh, and Moldova, and the three Baltic states. Um, so, uh, I suppose the research question of a question entitled was: Does Russia need a revolution in order to change? Having had two. Um, in the last 103 years, in 1917 and 1991. And these, the facetious answer is, is, is uh, no, it doesn't need a revolution if you happen to have 70 years on your hands. Um, but most of the evidence um, from the harder line states of the Soviet Union in the 1990s um, suggests that it does. These other states have not done particularly well. They, flour they have not flourished. Um, and they've retained Soviet, uh, what, what resemble what resemble sort of Soviet autocracies still. And there is very little, uh, there remains very little uh, liberal democracy in most of the successor states uh, to the Soviet Union. Now, uh, there are exceptions to this, of course. The Baltic states were never as Sovietized as the others, having only been governed from Moscow um, since the end of the Second World War and although it's more Scandinavian in, in background. Um, but um, in most places, this sort of Soviet legacy and mindset continued long after communism uh, had fallen away until, in some places, uh, there started to be some revolutions, starting with the Georgian Rose Revolution in 2003 and then the Ukrainian Orange one in 2004, along with smaller ones along the way until a second Ukrainian one in 2014. Um, these are the states 
uh, the ones which have experienced revolutions which have had the most change. So that would suggest that revolution is necessary in order to bring about certain change. Although one can also concede that in Armenia uh, in 2018 um, and in Moldova uh, just this year, just, just weeks ago, where a pro-Russian incumbent has been removed from power by a pro-European opposition leader, and Belarus, a half-finished revolution going on as we speak right now, um, are all challenges to this thesis. So it's a very complex picture, and it doesn't mean to say that. So some change is necessary by revolution, it would appear, and some can happen um, really actually at the ballot box, believe it or not, which is quite astonishing, even if it has been uh, 30 years to get to this point. And, but having said that, of course, these states are not really comparable to Russia. Russia's grip is tighter. It has more resources at its, at its, at its disposal. And there is, quite frankly, more at stake. Russia remains that dominant power. And although it is not the superpower, of course, that it once was, by any stretch of imagination, unless, of course, you are simply talking about nuclear weapons and geographical size, then uh, Russia, of course, has only the 13th largest economy in the world these days in GDP terms, maybe sixth or seventh in uh, PPP terms, uh, is a shadow of its former self technologically, uh, politically, diplomatically, scientifically, probably culturally, demographically, then Russia, I'm afraid, um, you wouldn't want to be it uh, right now. So my, my, my own view is that um, uh, Putinism, uh, which is essentially sort of strongman, semi-authoritarianism, um, will continue long after Putin leaves office, no matter, no matter when that is, and we know that he has the possibility of running until 2034 right now, although that does seem unlikely in my view, we can talk about it if you want to, but the least likely scenario in Russia is that a sort of liberalization taking over because the system isn't set up that way. True, of course, olive branches will be made to uh, inter by international leaders to the ne next Russian president, whoever he probably will be a he, I'm afraid to say, uh, is, but uh, I think that this person will be, uh, is unlikely to be a, a closet liberal, let alone an overt one. So we're set to continue with this diametrically opposed post-imperial half weak, half strong power for quite a long time to come, I'm afraid to say. And that, I leave you on that sort of slightly tantalizing note on purpose because I didn't want to go too much into the modern day international relations of it, but of course I'm delighted to discuss it in the questions and discussion. But I'll, I'll leave that there and I hope that it, that is um, reasonably useful and can be um, segued into the rest of this, uh, of this exciting conference. But thank you very much once again for this great honor. Thank you, Mr. Nixie, for sharing your significant views on the topic. Um, I'm delighted to invite a third speaker, Ms. Sonia Biserko, to take the floor. She was a Yugoslav diplomat for 17 years and is among the founders of the European movement in Yugoslavia and the Helsinki Committee for Human Rights in Serbia. A senior fellow of the U.S. Institute for Peace in Washington and member of the UN Commission of Inquiry for North Korea. She has won many awards for her work as a human rights defender and is the author of Yugoslavia's Implosion, Fatal Attraction of the Serbian Nationalism and other works on Yugoslavia's dissolution. She will speak on collapse of Yugoslavia from today's perspective. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Masuma Hassan for inviting me to take part in this panel. And I would be happy to share some of my comments on Yugoslavia's dissolution, which has been the topic or the subject of my life for the last 30 years, because I stayed here and was engaged all these years in uh, confronting the Serbian nationalism, defending human rights um, in many ways uh, for everybody in the region. But, but however, I would like to uh, come up with some uh, thoughts uh, because uh, uh, I think Yugoslav crisis or Yugoslav dissolution is still uh, very much uh, a topic uh, which engages many academicians, has been uh, in focus of many, uh, uh, not only statesmen, but also journalists, uh, academia, and I don't know how many have been published on Yugoslavia and uh, it's, it's still not finished and, and many people come back and reflect on what has happened 25 years ago. 
So the brutal uh, dissolution of Yugoslavia brought to light its many problems uh, while anticipating many problems of this of the contemporary times. The collapse of the communist bloc and the Soviet Union were tectonic upheavals not only for the socialist countries, but for the whole world. Since then, we have been witnessing historical shifts of economic and political power and uh, an easy process of adjustment between old and new emerging powers. The unfinished Yugoslav crisis reflects this new, unsettled and fragile international political landscape. Yugoslavia dissolution is going to be with us for a long time to come. It will be with us until historical truth is recognized and historical justice has been served, opening the way for the democratic future and true reconciliation and peaceful coexistence in and among countries. Yeah. I have to say that Yugoslavia was a complex community uh, which tried to find the best solution for the problems that it faced and that the world faces today. Those are the problems that mainly center on peaceful and harmonious coexistence of historical, cultural, political, economic, and religious and civilization differences. In the end, Yugoslavia failed to find a sustainable solution. The international community has been still searching for the right answers, the answers that would truly reflect and correspond with the spirit of the times. Some may find it paradoxical, but it is important to understand that Yugoslavia strived, albeit in different circumstances, toward the same goal that the European Union has been striving for so many decades, the goal of harmonization of interests of all its members within an optimal framework. Today, the European Union is once again at the crossroads. We are witnessing daily efforts to overcome, uh, to overcome the crisis and strengthen the unique nature of the European project. The European crisis is part of a much wider, complex and unpredictable predictable world economic, financial and political dynamics. Its solution requires wisdom, courage and sacrifice of some individual interests for the sake of a higher goal. Yugoslavia was also confronted with a crisis that required a high level of political maturity, responsibility, and awareness of the spirit of the times. Regrettable, in spite of all the efforts made by the international community, it fell apart in an unprecedentedly brutal way amidst enormous human loss and suffering, crimes against humanity and war crimes, genocide, a mass, a mass exodus and population transfer, material devastation, and of course, genocide, which I already mentioned. Second, Yugoslavia provided an important institutional framework for the national emancipation of all its nations, as well as for the definition of the borders of its republics and provinces. These borders are valid and internationally recognized today. The self-determination of the republics and the former Kosovo province and their subsequent independence marked the end of the historical process inaugurated by the Berlin Congress in, 19, in 1878. The Second Yugoslavia was preceded by another state from, from uh, in the period from 1918 to 1941. Thus both of them covered most of the 20th century. In the history of the Balkan nations, this is not a small achievement. Well, why did Yugoslavia fall apart? It fell apart because of different perceptions of its very birth and different concepts of the nature of the state, the way the country should have been organized and governed. On the one hand, Serbs interpreted and perceived Yugoslavia as extended Serbia, their state for which they fought and sacrificed in two world wars. On the other hand, other nations defended their concept of an association of equal nations. They rejected to be absorbed or assimilated with the Serbian concept of Yugoslavia. This tension was evident in the country's various stages of existence throughout the whole uh, century. At the very end of it, Serbia rejected the proposal of creation of the Union of Equal States or Confederation a new paradigm that should have been based on the genuine reassessment of the achievements and failures 
in the history of Yugoslavia and thus acceptable to all was not found. Uh, why, the question, why was it not possible for Yugoslavia to dissolve in a peaceful way? The answer is the following. The Serbian elites did not accept the evolving reality and the aspiration of other republics for a higher level of independence within a common Yugoslav state frame. The emancipation of the nations within Yugoslavia was an, an inevitable natural process. The evolution of Yugoslavia toward a more flexible federation can be followed through the many constitutional changes in the period from 1946 to 1974. The trend intensified in the 60s at the start of the process of true decentralization of Yugoslavia. The demand for more independence was put forward by all republics and provinces, although at different levels and in different spheres. This was the time when a part of the Serbian political elite in the 60s too also preferred a level of decentralization from the federal authorities. The constitution 1974 established the basic frame for the confederal Yugoslavia and its continuation on a new constitutional basis. The constitution was in fact the only option and the only guarantee for the survival of Yugoslav state. The constitution was accepted by all republics except Serbia uh, the Serbian elites rejected the concept because their main aim was to prevent this very development. Afterwards, all the activities focused on a single goal. They were focused on a single goal, the restoration of the centralist state. The Serbian elites aspired to establish a state in their own world, a state under their domination as the most numerous nation, as they say, and allegedly the only statehood capable nation in the Balkans, as they say, the backbone of the Balkans. The struggle for Tito's uh, legacy started by the demand for the revision of the Constitution 74. It was put forward already in 1977, but other republics didn't accept it. Tito's advanced stage was a plausible enough reason for Belgrade's leadership to slow down and prevent any progressive changes so as to get more time to thoroughly prepare for the reorganization of Yugoslavia. After Tito's death, Serbia and the Yugoslav army intensified their efforts for the redesign of the country. Preparations were underway to create the necessary conditions for the homogenization of Serbs throughout Yugoslavia. The majority of leading Serbian political, cultural, intellectual, uh, military and religious representatives participated in this endeavor and preparations for the war. At that time, the situation in Kosovo began to be used as a pretext for opening the so-called Serbian question in Yugoslavia, because Kosovo meat is deeply embedded in Serbian uh, memory, and it was really emotional, uh, uh, emotional way to sort of mobilize Serbs throughout the region. The widely known memorandum by the Serbian Academy was published in 86 as a strategic blueprint for the greater, Yugos greater Serbia national project. In fact, the memorandum just followed on the Serbian national program from the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. The then program demanded the liberation and unification of all Serbs and the establishment of the Serbian national uh, and state identity community on the whole Serbian the memorandum reaffirmed all key issues relevant for the realization of the Serbian national program. It also revealed the ongoing preparations in that direction. Members of the academy who had written the memorandum, uh, memorandum, members of the Serbian Association of Writers and other prominent cultural and public figures became the main promoters of memorandum's program. Historians be began to play an increasingly important role in the interpretation of all newly open issues. Their task was to create the necessary conditions for the dehumanization of the former neighbors through the successive campaigns of demonization of their ethnic groups as alleged enemies. One of the key issues, the issue of borders, which was to surface if there was no agreement between the Yugoslav nations on the new Yugoslav formula became the main topic of the public debate. 
the ideological leader of the renewed, uh, renewed national project, the author and the politician Dobrys Chosic and his associates never recognized the Republican borders, which had been defined during the Second World War and was the only formula to bring back Yugoslav Yugos nations in one state. He advocated a plebiscite on the right of self-determination of nations and not on the right of self-determination of republics. Chosic considered the former borders, with the exception of Slovenia, as a communist and provisional. He claimed that they were not established along ethical, ethical geopolitical, economic, or communication lines. The Serbian Orthodox Church also didn't recognize borders of Serbia uh, in Yugoslavia either, and the church played a very uh, important role in mobilizing uh, Serbs throughout the region on the Second World War atrocities and genocide over Serbs. Another argument which emerged in late 80s and early 90s was the alleged rise of uh, Islamic fundamentalism in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo. The, the memorandum didn't dwell on this issue because it was expected that in the case of collapse of Yugoslavia, Bosnia and Herzegovina would remain a part of a common state with Serbia, Montenegro and Macedonia. Memorandum became the ideological guidance of the new regime under the populist politician Sloboda Milosevic, who had risen from the Communist Party ranks to leadership position. The memorandum did not plan to abandon the socialist system. Its critique focused on the problems of decentralization, which was perceived as a threat to the survival of Yugoslavia and Serbia's claim on it. The issues of democratization and modernization of the country were sidelined and put off to the time when the Serbian national question has been resolved. The resolution of national question a greater ethnic Serbian state at any cost became the top political priority. Milosevic regime started to propagate its uh, exclusivist nationalist ideology. The Serbian nation was glorified while the others were vilified, especially Croats, Albanians and Muslims. In fact, the process of destruction of Yugoslavia was executed under the pretext of the efforts to save Yugoslavia. Protests were organized and orchestra orchestrated in all the regions of Yugoslavia where Serbian population lived, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Kosovo. At the federal level, the political debate on resolution of, crisis, of the crisis and the reorganization of Yugoslavia became deeply polarized between the concept of re-centralization under Serbian domination and creation of the Union of States Republics within the common Yugoslav frame. No consensus was possible between the two totally opposing sides. The federal government led by Prime Minister Ante Marković was pro-reformist and pro-European. In 90, Yugoslavia was the on threshold of, of the association agreement with the European community, similar to the one Cyprus had at that time. The agreement was supposed to be concluded after the expiration of bilateral trade agreement in 90. However, economic reforms introduced or planned by the federal government had no chance of succeeding without fundamental political changes. The war blew away all reforms plans. The Yugoslav Peace Conference convened in September 91 by the European community with Lord Carrington as chairman was the last chance to save the common Yugoslav state frame and a find of solution to the divisions inflaming the country. After Serbia's rejection of the Hague proposals, the Badita Arbitration Commission brought, uh, uh, brought about between uh, late 91 and the middle of 93, 15 opinions regarding legal issues arising from the fragmentation of Yugoslavia. Already in November 91, the Commission concluded that Yugoslavia was in the process of dissolution. The reformer boundaries became protected by international law and that minority rights should be fully respected in accordance with the international law. Eventually, the Commission would recommend that European community accept the request of successive states for recognition after being given guarantees in regard to the respect of human and, my, and minority rights and international peace and security. Yeah. At that time, Yugoslav army already stood firmly behind Serbia. Therefore, Serbia rejected the peace conference proposal and embarked with the army support on the path of the military conquest of Yugoslavia with the aim of recentralization of the country or the establishment of a new country that would assure the unification of all Serbs within a single state. 
the rest, uh, they say, the history. As you know, we had the war was stopped in former Yugoslavia, primarily by intervention of United States. European Union at that time was not, didn't have a common foreign policy and was rather focused on its own problems, which emerged through enlargements uh, and many other, and, uh, uh, and um, their own sort of heading to unitary uh, monetary reform and uh, union and so on. Uh, and we had uh, uh, the peace agreements were brokered by Americans, Dayton Peace Agreement, which is very much uh, on the agenda even today. And after 25 years, uh, 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 it is now being discussed uh, by, by Biden administration and the European Union to be um, redesigned because uh, Bosnia stayed as a dysfunctional state. Later on, there was a Kosovo uh, case with the uh, resolution Pell 44. And uh, in the meantime, Kosovo declared independence. It was pending for many years because Serbia never agreed to it. Though Serbia gave up on Kosovo already in the 80s because they could not dominate uh, a dominant uh, Albanian population, but they kept it open and pending issue because they thought they could compensate with the uh, partition of Bosnia, uh, taking, uh, 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 annexing uh, uh, Montenegro. And nowadays they are really messing up, messing up in uh, uh, Kosovo. Montenegro kind of um, uh, 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 in achieving their goals by diplomatic uh, means, and they almost uh, succeeded. Uh, and uh, uh, Trump administration was uh, willing to sort of uh, meet some of the Serbian uh, uh, aspirations, but uh, new administration has uh, deeply disturbed Serbian political and other elites in Belgrade because what they are now announcing as a new approach to the Balkans is. Uh, 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 is that they are this, uh, finally deciding to close down the Balkan issue as, uh, first of all, as the security priority of Europe and the United States. Um, uh, regrettably, the concept of unification of all Serbs is still alive and kicking. Uh, and because Republika Srpska, 49% uh, of um, uh, Bosnian territory is considered uh, as a major Serbian military victory in 20th century. They called the war, qualified the war in Bosnia as liberation war of Serbs. Uh, they, they, as I have already mentioned, they're interfering in Montenegro. Um, uh, 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 new situation after the last elections, Montenegro uh, 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 declared uh, independence in 2006, um, Kosovo in 2008, which was really the last phase of dissolution of Yugoslavia. But Serbia um, is still unwilling to concede and to sort of acknowledge new reality in the region. Uh, in the meantime, I would just uh, finish with that. Both United States and uh, EU uh, which has a mandate for the Balkan region since uh, 2003, when they opened the possibility of the membership of all Balkan states into the EU, somehow disengaged in the Balkans after 2008 and later on, uh, which created space or so vacuum for another for other international actors like Russia, like Turkey. Uh, uh, like uh, China recently, but uh, Russia, for Russia it was easy to step in, though they didn't bring much. They tried to sort of impose uh, their energy deal through the South Pipeline gas, but that didn't succeed. It was removed. But there, in the Serbian population, Russians have uh, some kind of um, uh, how to say um, has some kind of uh, bond, which is also I would say mythological because throughout the history, Russia was not really the state which was uh, defending Serbian interests, though this is now very much talked about. It was, Russia was more in, focused on Bulgaria, for example, and still is, I would say. But anyway, Russia is in the region and uh, 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 Foreign Minister Lavrov was in Bosnia two days ago and in Belgrade. Uh, it was some kind, in my view, message to Americans to say, we are here, you will have to talk with us. So I, I, 
you know, uh, the Balkans are still an open issue. And uh, of course, nowadays it is Russia, which is uh, trying to impose itself as a regional part of factor, and which it is uh, in my view. But uh, uh, of course, uh, we'll see how uh, the relation between US, EU and Russia will develop in the future. It won't be easy, but uh, however, uh, uh, US and EU uh, cooperation in the Balkans is welcome and it's, it will uh, uh, bring in the region some new energy, some new investments, uh, economic, uh, first of all, and then of course they want to uh, uh, round up Balkans as some kind of uh, security uh, issue. And uh, I would stop here and then we can, uh, I can respond to questions if there are any questions for what I have so far uh, put in front of you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Viserico, uh, for such a great presentation. Our last speaker is Mr. Shah Rukh Shah Nawaz. He is a member of the Pakistan Institute of International Affairs, a practicing advocate of High Court of Sindh, and visiting faculty member in the Department of International Relations, University of Karachi. Formerly, he served as civil judge and judicial magistrate in Karachi and has published on legal matters. His most recent publication is Understanding the Clash Between Sovereignty and Universal Jurisdiction, which appeared in Pakistan Horizon. He will wrap up the session and speak on states divided by foreign intervention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this honor. I hope I am audible. Am I audible? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Dr. Masuma, for giving me this opportunity. And I am honored to be present among a very distinguished and experienced panel of speakers. The question why states disintegrate is exceedingly difficult and complex. The First World War saw the collapse of great empires and the end of Second World War witnessed the death of colonialism altogether. The states that emerged from the ashes of the empires confronted a series of problems that they inherited from their colonial masters and had to choose a side in a bipolar world. Most of the states faced internal problems and conflicts and those with weak civil, political, and legal infrastructure were unable to overcome those challenges successfully and eventually collapsed. Pakistan faced the same fate as after independence, the civil and political leadership miserably failed to bring the two sides together. And the military rule did not offer any viable long-term solution to an extraordinarily complex problem. No doubt, outside intervention, especially by the world powers, is also responsible for the division of states, such as North and South Korea, North and South Vietnam. In the case of Vietnam, the first Indochina war began in French Indochina during the period of 1946 and 1954 between French forces and Viet Minh. Viet Minh was aided after 1949 by the new communist government of China by the United States, fear of the, fearful of the spread of communism in Asia, provided aid to the French. However, after the fall of French garrison at Dien Mien Phu in May 1954, it was agreed to negotiate an end to the war. This decision was taken at an international conference in Geneva. The Geneva Accords of 1954 were signed by French and Viet Minh, which provided for a ceasefire and temporary division of the country into two military zones at the 17th parallel. All Viet Minh forces were to withdraw north of that line and all French and associated state of Vietnam troops were to remain at the south. The world thus saw the creation of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam or North Vietnam and the Republic of Vietnam also known as South Vietnam. An international commission was established composed of Canadian, Polish, and Indian members to supervise the execution of the agreement. The last of the Geneva Accords, also called the Final Declaration, 
provided for elections. These elections were supposed to be supervised by the commission and to be held throughout Vietnam in 1956 in order to unify the country. Whitman was certain to win the elections and therefore United States and the leaders in the South would not approve or sign the final declaration. Thus, the dreaded elections were never held. So it was the outside intervention that led to the creation of North and South Vietnam. Another example is of the division of Korea due to outside intervention. The Cairo Declaration of 1943 by the United States, United Kingdom and the Republic of China or the Nationalist China promised independence for Korea, but in due course. This vague phrase in the due course compared the provisional government of Korea to request interpretation from the United States, but unfortunately, they received no answer. At the Yalta Conference of 1945, United States President Franklin D. Roosevelt proposed and Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin agreed to a four power trusteeship of Korea consisting of the United States, United Kingdom of Great Britain, the Soviet Union and China. But they did not reach any formal agreement on the future status of Korea. The general order number one by the United States regarding the terms of surrender of Japan and Korea provided for Japanese forces at the north of the 38th parallel to surrender to the Soviet forces and those at the south of that line to the United States forces. Stalin did not object to the order and after the US received the Japanese surrender in Seoul, there would now be two zones. That is Northern and Southern. The principal reason for the division was for the United States to be able to stop the Soviet expansion south of the 30th parallel. These two events, division of Korea and Vietnam, successfully demonstrate how states are divided by foreign intervention without any concern for the sovereignty, nationality, and the desire of self-rule of the local population. And by outrightly discarding and disregarding the will of the people by the, global uh, by the global powers, only to safeguard their own interests. The phenomenon of outside intervention is not only limited to small and weak states. The existence of the People's Republic of China and the Republic of China, also known as Taiwan, and the sudden collapse of former Soviet Union into 15 independent states is a proof that outside intervention has played a crucial role in the disintegration of states. The case of United Kingdom of Great Britain is of peculiar importance. As even though Scotland had previously voted to remain part of the union in 2014's referendum, after Brexit, the possibility of an independent Scotland is now rapidly growing. But the reunification of Vietnam, Yemen and Germany can help us imagine the possibilities which could be achieved through greater cooperation and coexistence. In today's program, we had a chance to glimpse into the past and understand the phenomena of states breaking up. It is a complex combination of various factors. We started with the fall of Dhaka in 1971 and Madam Dr. Masuma rightly pointed out the factors that led, that led to this calamity. It is interesting to note how the two views drastically differ, the view of Pakistan and the other side, the civil war, the surrender, casualties. The historical account will always be important to understand the phenomena of states breaking us, as in the case of Pakistan. Geography, vulnerability of defense of East Pakistan, six points of Mujib, and the concept or the failure to understand the Muslim Bengali nationalism were indeed very crucial, are very crucial to understand to demise of the East Pakistan. Political solution over military use is always going to be a question which the which as Pakistani are, are always going to wonder. And Hamidur Rahman report was the first step towards the accountability and the issue of stranded Biharis in East Pakistan, former East Pakistan and present day Bangladesh 
is always going to haunt every Pakistani until they live. Mr. James Nixie had a daunting task of explaining if Russia needs revolution to change. Collapse of USSR is again, as he, as he rightly pointed out, was no one expecting. Its geography, its diversity, its nuclear weapon, and its sudden collapse are still, uh, are still give us a uh, different uh, perspective of understanding why states divide, collapse, or disintegrate. He discussed about political factor with respect to Mikhail Gorbachev and the policy of Glasnost and Perestroika, the economic factor, especially the military expenditure of Soviet Union, military factor, uh, especially about uh, uh, the invasion of Afghanistan, and then the external factor that United States uh, transition from containing the Soviet Union to finally dismantling it. Further understanding the current regime of Soviet Union, we came to know that Boris Yeltsin was democratic at heart, but it was not enough. And therefore, Putin was given free hand. And now, ironically, that free hand has, be, uh, has been transformed into an iron hand. So he interestingly said that there might be no need of revolution, but still, the former republics of Soviet Union still lack liberal democracy. So the revolution might be necessary. Madam Sonia, dealt with the nightmare which the humanity saw in the aftermath of the disintegration of former Yugoslavia. And we learned how conflict is very important to understand the demise of any state. The issue of former Yugoslavia or its, or its disintegration is still very much alive, as she rightly said, and it will remain alive until its true reconciliation. There were many factors which were pointed out by her, but the problem of peaceful coexistence among the people of diverse background is, a st is still a big challenge in today's world. EU is at the crossroad, she rightly said, and so is the world community. Because, uh, because there are still great challenges ahead as we are revisiting the Dayton Agreement and there is a new approach to deal with the, uh, to, uh, to deal with the uh, Balkan states. In the end, the people of Pakistan are still haunted by the bitter memory of 1971 and still question themselves that whether they will again witness another 1971. And if so, are they prepared to prevent such a crisis from escalating and to be able to resolve it peacefully? Let us end on a good note and hope. I am thankful for this wonderful and amazing panel of distinguished speakers and to Madam Dr. Masuma for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sharuk, for your uh, such a great presentation. Uh, now it is the time to have question and answer session. And I am going to ask the questions on behalf of our attendees and participants. Uh, the first question I'm going to ask is uh, from Dr. Masuma Hassan, chairperson of uh, the Institute. Uh, and this question is for Ms. Mr. Nixie. And the question is, how do the Soviet people view the collapse of their country today? Do the former Soviet republics have a sense of nostalgia? Uh, Mr. Nixie, Excuse me. could you please unmute yourself? Thank you yourself? very much indeed. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, just done it. Um, thank you very much indeed uh, for the question, uh, Dr. Hassan. And um, it's, uh, it's uh, as always, with a country this large and an empire <laughs> that, uh, that quickly or slowly uh, destroyed, then it's a complex picture. But I think, you know, at the risk of gross generalization, then it is uh, clear that most people, uh, the Russians are a proud nation, uh, understandably, because they have a lot to be proud about. They also have a lot to be shamed, sh ashamed for as well, by the way, because there's no pride about shame and there's no shame about pride. I mean, uh, otherwise the two emotions, if you like, are, are dishonest. 
Um, but, and of course, there is a tendency to overlook the shameful periods in Russian history and to think about the, uh, the, um, the elements that they are, they are rightly proud of. So I understand that. But it is interesting to me that it is not only the older generation uh, in Russia today who have a uh, nostalgia, as, as you put it, uh, for the Soviet past. Even people who were born after the fall of the Soviet Union seem to, these days, often have a desire that Russia should continue to be uh, at the top table and one of one or two, one or three, uh, one of one or three great powers in the world, even though they didn't live during, you know, what I think could very questionably could be called the glory days or the golden days of the Soviet Union. And I find that hard to understand uh, myself, uh, but I, it is nonetheless true that um, the up and coming generation, which is beginning to sort of feed even into Vladimir Putin's entourage, um, into some of his closest people, um, still have this ultra nationalism um, as part of their makeup, which has obviously been educated into them, inculcated into them, as opposed to them having experienced it firsthand uh, themselves. Obviously, as I say, I can't emphasize enough that that is a gross generalization um, and that there are, uh, you know, substantial numbers of either apolitical. Um, or relatively liberal Russians, but I'm afraid that is not actually in the minority. And it's interesting because obviously I'm, all, I'm always sort of mindful not to, not to talk about Russia as a single entity, as a monolith, because when obviously there is a, a relatively small number of influential decision makers around the president himself. Um, but at the same time, I can't help in sort of, in terms of intellectual honesty, um, but, but say that, that that there is um, this, this uh, post-empire residual makeup inside the, uh, inside the Russian mindset still seems to be quite prevalent. And it is true that in a semi-authoritarian regime, not an ultra-authoritarian regime like, like North Korea, but in a semi-authoritarian regime like Russia, that uh, the uh, the leadership is responsive. I, 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 Russia is by no means a democracy, and yet at the same time, the leadership is responsive to the uh, emotions and the feelings of, of its people. Uh, not always, and of course, there are limits to this point, but uh, at the end of the day, the uh, annexation of Crimea uh, and the victorious war in Georgia in 2008 um, did appeal to the, sent to, the, to the glory days, and the Russian uh, leadership achieved a significant steroid boost um, as a result of those uh, national glory wars, in spite of what you and I might think of as being, so, of, uh, as being uh, legally and morally questionable. So the Russian people, um, to be admired, respected, and listened to, actually do merit um, a share of a responsibility um, for what we actually see today. I don't know if that answers your question. I'm certainly happy to carry on, but I'm, I'm afraid of, of wobbling on for too long. Um, okay. Uh, so my next question is uh, from Mr. Javier Jabbar. And again, this question is for Mr. Nixie. With reference to Mr. Nixie's uh, presentation, Whereas Gorbachev simultaneously attempted to change both political and economic communism, Deng in China only initiated and sustained change in, change in economic communism while strongly retaining political communism. Is this not why China became the world's second largest economy, whereas the USSR collapsed and Russia today has regressed? Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, I'm a bit embarrassed to be doing another question, but um, I, I can certainly um, have a, or at least try for half of this. To be perfectly honest with you, sir, um, uh, Mr. Javi Jabbar, then I, um, 
I, I, obviously you would need a China expert and I'm certainly not one to answer at least half of this question. Um, and I, I'm not really um, skilled enough uh, or expert enough to be able to tell you precisely why China rose as it did. But I am persuaded by your argument, which I think essentially is, is, is the idea that whilst Russia underwent perestroika and glasnost, then China underwent only perestroika, only the economic restructuring part and its ability to, to stifle any glasnost part, not least um, uh, in the Tiananmen Square uh, massacre, uh, then actually enabled it to uh, escape the trauma that the Soviet Union went through in the 1990s, when, as I say, it let the toothpaste out of a tube and couldn't 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 put it back in. So I I, I, I am minded to agree, and I think the the Russians obviously sorry the Chinese learnt from the mistakes of the Soviet slash Russians, um, and they determined uh, to do something different whilst also recognizing that they needed to change and reform their own system as well. Very few people had a copy of a little red book back in the 1990s. So I think that is a very fair assessment as far as I know. Um, and these days, what it has led to is actually China not especially respecting Russia as a result. Russia is recognized in China as a weak power, um, as a quarry from which to extract natural resources and not an analogous um, co-partner of ill equals, which is what Russia demands, of course, both with the West and with China on historical grounds. So uh, again, we very much need a China person to, to answer at least the second half of this question. Um, but I, I'm broadly persuaded by the argument that, um, which, is a, which is an uncomfortable moral argument, but China's suppression of individual freedoms when it had the option to go the other way um, meant that it did succeed in economic and geopolitical terms where Russia failed. So I think I, I mean, the short answer is, is that I would, I would have to agree with you, sir. Thank you. Um, my next question is from Dr. Tanvir Khalid. And this question is for Ms. Sonia. How do Serbians feel about trials of leaders like Slobodan Milosevic <coughs> and Rudovan uh, Karadzic for war crimes and accountability? I'm, I'm sorry to have to say that Serbia didn't deal uh, with its past and responsibility. Neither did ICTY uh, judgments had any impact on the changing of um, system values which were uh, in place all these years, all decades, and even today. Uh, so Bolan Milosevic uh, over the time became a hero who did the most in the given uh, context and environment, uh, meaning relating to the international community of intervention. And uh, they continued, as, as I said, up to 2000 with diplomatic and other means to follow their own, their, their project and their aims. Uh, both uh, Slobodan Milosevic and Karadzic are the heroes who sacrifice uh, for the national interest. And there are, and many others who have finished their sentences in the prisons uh, all over Europe went back in Belgrade, they're uh, seen as uh, public figures, they're glorified, they're given a lot of space in the media and the public space generally. They are uh, very much uh, uh, engaged in the TV talk shows and they really frame, the problem is that they uh, frame the mindset of young generations who have little knowledge about 90s because uh, though it is uh, uh, accessible in in many ways, but you know, in the school, in the in their families, and uh, in the country itself, uh, it's not the topic which is discussed in that way. Serbs are the victims; they are surrounded by enemies. Uh, we are now turning to Russia, who is our major uh, uh, protector throughout the whole century. And I would say the Serbian nationalism is in a way russified. For example, Russia donated uh, um, a statue of their Tsar which is now in front of our presidency. And Tsar and Serbia uh, and Tsar had never any relation to, uh, to Yugoslavia. Then first Yugoslavia didn't have diplomatic relations with Russia because it was a communist country at that time. And uh, there are many other ways of Russian penetration in the culture. 
in the public and media space. And this is the, uh, I would say, soft power which they have in our society. And this is what is hampering our um, uh, European future. Because, for example, uh, Russia is not in the first 10 donors uh, to, uh, to Serbia, but the public perception perception is that Russia is the biggest donor in the region, whereas EU is really the biggest contributor to everything that is um, helping Serbia to survive. For example, during the COVID uh, crisis at the beginning, Russian, uh, China, uh, China help and donation was uh, glorified and uh, they complained about uh, lack of solidarity from the EU, whereas the EU uh, uh, EU airplanes uh, went to China and brought all these masks and all this uh, unnecessary equipment for uh, protection. So this is really, uh, I would say, uh, it serves a frustrated nation with the loss of Yugoslavia, which they perceived as their empire. The moment when others were asking for more decentralized and more, I would say, independent um, position in the country, uh, they uh, I, I would I would say from today's perspective, there or there must be a lot of frustration among Serbian elites because they the lost they lost the country where all Serbs were in one state, and it's absolutely unimaginable that Serbia can get away with their project because had it been possible, they would get it many many times before. International community won't let them cross the Drina River, and the comeback of United States in the region now with the new administration is something which is uh, extremely sort of uh, frustrating uh, president who is the major pillar of our foreign, uh, foreign policy and he is now he lost the support both of uh, Americans and the EU especially Germans who were supporting him for many reasons why he cannot Against that. Secondly, uh, dominant uh, elites in Serbia are still on this same project and church, uh, academia, intellectuals. And for example, nowadays they're all love visit yesterday is now glorified. All media are full of, uh, you know, Serbia and, um, and Russia are the strongest. You know, it's uh, in a way they don't understand Russian policy here because Russia came here, Lavrov came to the Balkans, as I said. To send the message to Americans, and they give up. They will give up on us the moment they find uh, make an agreement with uh, with the United States and EU on some other issues which are more relevant for their national interests than Balkans. It doesn't mean that the Balkans are not their sphere of interest, historically speaking. But at this moment, they're not able to spread so much as, as uh, our colleague has uh, pointed out. Uh, they are more concerned on their neighborhood. And they are able to destabilize them through minority issues, especially like Serbia did in Croatia, Bosnia, Montenegro nowadays, Kosovo, and so on. They keep uh, all these issues pending. And in a way, they keep, uh, they, they are surrounded by the countries as their safe, safety belt. And they are, of course, annoyed by the NATO and EU enlargement. Uh, and this is something that they're trying to, uh, in the region, to show to EU, first of all, that their cohesion is a problematic one and that, uh, you know, because uh, they cannot stretch until um, Bosnia, but they can show that both the Americans and NATO that they can uh, uh, mean in the region in a way, either by obstructing or by making a deal on some other issues. My next question is from Mr. Ehsanullah, and this question is for Dr. Masuma Hassan. Uh, Dr. Hassan, whom do you think was primarily responsible for the division of Pakistan? Is it India, Sheikh Mujib, Pakistan Army, or late Prime Minister Zulfikar Ali Bhutto? Uh, Dr. Masuma, please unmute yourself. I don't hear. Uh, 
Can you hear me now? Yes. I said that is a very tricky question to answer because there's no scale really on which you can say who was more responsible and who was not more responsible. Looking back, if you see the, the various interests, I would say it was a joint venture, an unfortunate joint venture. And uh, each party blames the other, the Bengalis, the Army League think it was the Pakistan Army. The Pakistan Army thought that it was, you know, the secessionist elements in Bengal. So really you have many narratives. You have many, many narratives and it's very difficult to say who was responsible. But so far as the blood, uh, bloodshed and carnage was concerned, I think uh, both sides were involved in it. It was not just Pakistan's army, it was not just the Mukti Bahani and the Awami League disobedience movement. Everybody had uh, a share in it. And it was the Indians also who came in and uh, who, who just walked into our country and helped to disintegrate it. And they are very proud of it to this day. They were proud of it that day. It is, was nothing to be proud of. It's nothing to be proud of to help to tear a country apart. But they are proud of it even today. So recently, when Mr. Modi went to East Pakistan, uh, sorry, to Bangladesh, he reminded them that uh, India had helped to uh, help them to attain their own independence. That is a narrative which they keep repeat, repeating all the time. So really, one can't say who is responsible. About the politicians in, in Pakistan, you know, none of them really accepted the, the secession of East Pakistan. In principle, not the People's Party, not the other political parties. Thank you. Uh, my next question is from Sayyid Mohammed Shah. And this question is directed uh, towards uh, Ms. Uh, Sonia Basurko. Yeah. Can we make a comparative analysis of the effects of breakup of Yugoslavia and that of Austro-Hungarian Empire? And have Yugoslavia learned lesson from the first split? I think that we are still learning the lesson. Uh, unfortunately, the region is not yet stable. It's unfinished business, as they like to say in the EU, especially in Bosnia and Kosovo. If, if they revisit the region, and I hope they will in an appropriate way, uh, finalize the pending issues, then maybe reconciliation or normalization may start. But uh, unfortunately, ICTY, which was established for uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to trial the crimes against humanity, genocide, and so on, uh, did not uh, is not incorporated uh, are not incorporated in our system, and neither it has affected the social norms, uh, you know, the impunity and so on. So this is a really long way ahead, and I think it's a transgenerational, uh, how should I say, um, task or process. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that the current uh, political elite can cope with that. First of all, they were part of Milosevic's project, President uh, Vucic and his party were the fist of this, uh, of this project in the 90s. And their leader, then leader, was tried in The Hague. And he is one of the public uh, figures. He's a member of the parliament, a moral vertical of the society. So, I mean, there are so, so many anomalies. And the uh, EU didn't manage to find a mechanism how to force Serbia but others in the region as well to cope with this uh, uh, legacy of the ICTY uh, and also many other findings that other courts, international, uh, um, uh, international Uh, where we had two and so on, to bring back these uh, societies or people together because social fabric is so destroyed, especially in Bosnia. 
and, uh, uh, and all these regions affected by the conflict, it takes time. And so far, it was not seriously taken. There are many NGOs in the region, including my own, uh, which, was, uh, which were um, engaged in sort of uh, promoting this. And, but we were vilified and uh, demonized in our societies. And, uh, and it's sort of, there are a lot of information which are accessible uh, in all these societies, but it's not a main, mainstream truth. As long as it is so, I think these societies won't be able to uh, to normalize in a way that is expected and become truly democratic society. We are a liberal society. We are in kind of regression process. Uh, we have an authoritarian uh, leader. Uh, former Yugoslavia was much more, was much more pluralistic, being one party system and more democratic in a way in the last two decades of its existence than we have um, um, in the current uh, successor states. I think uh, the status quo as it is now, uh, is something which is uh, objected in all these uh, countries, especially in Serbia, but also in Bosnia, which is divided along ethnic lines and uh, cannot function as a normal state because uh, everybody is sort of pushing in, the, in following its uh, ethnic uh, ethnic agendas. Uh, I would conclude with the uh, with the argument that ethnic states cannot survive and because they are not inclusive and all these societies are still multi-ethnic. There should be some kind of uh, uh, ethnic and uh, civic uh, uh, principles and combine them in all the, what Yugoslavia was at the time really and, and, and was trying to sort of bring all these nations uh, in the harmony and that is what is needed now. Uh, it's very important to find the right measure for each society, how they can survive and be very inclusive because, for example, Serbia has uh, three major big uh, minorities which are uh, territorially consolidated. You have Albanians in the south, not Kosovo, but uh, minority in Serbia, Bosniaks in Sanjak, and you have Hungarians in, in the north. Hungarians are a well organized minority which uh, is only waiting for a moment to ask for the territorial autonomy of secession. This is uh, it, it is all there. So if you if you give in on one case, uh, you can expect uh, many other countries in the region to ask for the same, and also in Eastern Europe, because you have uh, so many uh, different uh, situations, like in Slovakia, you have uh, Hungarians, in Romania, you have Hungarians. Uh, Bulgarians tried to stop um, uh, uh, North Macedonia now, which had to uh, change the name in order to have Greece uh, uh, let her in in the NATO. And now Bulgaria is trying to stop its uh, approximation to the EU and opening up the dialogue. And, you know, EU was slow to put the pressure on Bulgaria. Now, finally, they have come to the uh, uh, conclusion, consensus to sort of, uh, First of all, put the blame on Macedonians not to have aspirations on Bulgaria. Whereas Bulgaria started the whole story with uh, uh, denying uh, uh, Macedonians their nation and their language, and their identity. So you have so many issues which can just uh, emerge at any moment if you are not uh, uh, um, pursuing a, a set of principles which should resolve the region. Uh, on the same level. And this is what uh, was lacking in our situation because EU and the US didn't have a comprehensive approach to all these cases. And Serbia was always the biggest. And so everybody was appeasing to Serbia because it is the factor of stability or disability. And I think this is against our interest because we should be treated equally. And this is why we think that uh, we have the, some kind of blackmailing potential. And which are they using now because they are they have uh, relations to Russia or China, uh, and that this is sort of blackmailing of the U.S. and uh, EU in the region. So, and this is why this process of consolidation of the region is so slow because local leaders also engage in this kind of manipulation, uh, and not to mention the other big ones who are playing their own games for some other reasons. Uh, my next question is for Mr. Sharuf Shanavaz, and this question is from uh, Mr. Aga Masood. The question is, why do you think that East Pakistan debacle could be repeated today in Pakistan? Um, thank you for the question. I hope I'm audible. Well, this is uh, not actually my affair, and this is not even a political question. 
in my opinion it is a legal question because the legal issues which were there during the uh, during the period of 1971 are still unresolved when we talk about hamidur rahman commission report it was supposed to be followed by accountability there never was it is still uh, it, it, this issue is pretty much alive and it is legal the issue of a biharis refugee stranded in east pakistan or sorry former east pakistan and now bangladesh is still a legal question which is alive and we are still not ad- and we are still not addressing it the last and the most important problem was the sharing of government the issue of autonomy what are the subjects of central government and what is the and what are going to be the subject of provincial government unfortunately that issue is also very much alive after the demise of east pakistan we were able to make a constitution 1973 document which is a very important and, and a very comprehensive document i must say but the issue is, is still very much there the center and the shift between the center and provincial power of autonomy sharing of government how they are going to use the resources is still very much alive these legal questions are always overshadowed by the political debates and political arguments i think we should stop doing that and we have to take these issues head on treat them legally and reach to a conclusion which is acceptable and pragmatic in uh, in my view thank you i hope i have answered the question thank you my next question is uh, from mr junaid ehsan and this question is for mr james nixie how different is putin's russia from that of the ussr except for economic policies and corruption there we go thank you very much indeed for for your question um <clears throat> it is again a, a tremendously big question and and i can't possibly do it justice uh in in such a a, a short time um there are those who would say that uh putin you know is effectively reestablishing the soviet union and that there the differences are so small uh as to be inconsequential um and that is not although that is a gross generalization it's not entirely unfair in so far as russia still demands a sphere of influence it demands this way if you want to call it a cordon sanitaire um uh, a buffering um a historically conditioned sphere of mutually privileged interests as vyacheslav surkov um uh, described it memorably then obviously russia's ambitions in terms of uh its neighborhood and worldwide uh, uh are analogous to those of the soviet union which is not so much world domination as much as it is recognition that uh Russia and a veto in all major issues of global affairs um so i think that is a reasonable proposition but of course we must understand that the world has changed <coughs> um here in, in 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 ways in which could not possibly have been imagined um back in soviet times and that uh the conditions and the ideological uh competition between uh what was the soviet union uh and the united states but is now russia and the united states is is largely absent russia has a very different world view to that of the united states it does not adhere to the rules based international order tattered and battered as it is um but it instead it rather and but it doesn't really have a model of its own that if 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 it can be said at all that communism um uh, was a model at all then i don't think uh i mean i was listening to sonia speaking and talking about uh the serbian sort of residual uh uh love and admiration uh for for Russia and i understand and i accept that point but i also don't believe that russia is now seen in the west uh so it is now seen anywhere quite frankly as being uh, a model to follow or to aspire to because 
the empirical results of the aftermath of communism and the subsequent 30 years experience simply don't look good. You know, whether, you know, the capital, whether it's from the point of view of capital flight and the billions that have fled Russia uh, or have, 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 have leaked from Russia, if you like, uh, in the last uh, decade, um, or whether it's in terms of personal immigration and the, the fleeing of a, a fleeing from the Western term, whether it's brain drain or at the political level and, and the, uh, you know, what one might want to call the defectors, then, of course, that is all one way. So, again, there are a lot of parallels, but I think we have to be very mindful of the situations. And as we're all historians here, to greater or lesser extents, lesser in my case, then... Um, I think we should be mindful of over um, uh, analogizing, over comparing uh, two very different world systems because Russia is now claiming its uh, status in the world on the basis of history, whereas back in the Soviet days, uh, it had a more valid claim. Um, and of course, it still retains its UN Security Council permanent membership naturally and some of but these are all, these are all residual effects of what it once was, rather than being on the metrics right now. Perhaps whilst I'm just here, very briefly, because there was a question um, which quite rightly brought me up on the idea of the, um, that I, I mentioned that Vladimir Putin said, because this is related, that the end of the Soviet Union uh, was the greatest geopolitical uh, disaster of the 20th century. And I was rightly brought up because obviously he did continue saying that, uh, but you, with, your, with his heart, you know, he regrets it, but with his head, he knows it's not um, not a possibility. And that's, that is fair. And I think, you, you know, the questioner was right to bring me up on that, except to say that anybody who believes that even with your heart, that the Soviet Union, with all of the evils um, that, uh, that uh, emanated from it, whether that is uh, the gulag or the repression of a stifling, um, then I think that my, you know, my uh, if your if your heart is in it, then that that does not do you any credit. So it is it is I think fair to bring up that I was not comprehensive in what I said, but I don't think that is in any way a justification uh, of what uh, of what of, of what Vladimir said simply because I was I was incomplete in my pronouncement. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, our last question is from Ms. Mehnaz Rehman. And this question is for, again, for Mr. James Nixie. The collapse of the Soviet Union was a hard blow for all the progressive people of this world. And now the world has become unipolar. Where should the working class look at to combat neoliberalism? Ooh, gosh, that is a... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a, that is a, I mean, I suppose obviously it depends upon where you're coming from to answer that question. Uh, and uh, if uh, my, my, my own view, it's related to the last question um, in terms of how one views the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, I differ from Vladimir Putin insofar as I believe personally that the uh, destruction and dismantling uh, of, of that oppressive system and the um, oppression that it held over another 13 independent countries and 150 odd million people um, was a wholly good thing in spite of the, uh, the subsequent chaos that it brought. Um, and I'm not suggesting, by the way, I do understand that the Soviet Union imposed a level of civility and peace in, say, the South Caucasus, for example, of the North Caucasus, but it simply isn't there now. I understand that point. But of course, uh, you know, there's no sacrifice, uh, there's, there's no reward without sacrifice, uh, as the saying goes. So, I mean, I, I don't think, so I, 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 whether you regard the current state of the world in terms of a retreat from liberalism um, as temporary or, or a trend, or whether you regard it as positive or negative, I think very much uh, influences your answer to this question. Um, but again, I would say that Russia's, although Russia maintains, uh, or, or, or although Russia wins many victories, it does seem to be losing the war, if that makes any sense. So its victories are Pyrrhic. And as a result of that, 
then uh, I think we, so what we're looking at is Russia's inevitable decline. Um, and the question, therefore, from that is, is how do we manage that inevitable decline going forward, you know, and stay out of war, and stay out of war? Because the difficulty, the danger is, is that with the, with the absence of under the understandings that there was in the Cold War, um, and then then it's actually a more dangerous time. And, and the, uh, the likelihood of miscalculation and accidentally falling into war does strike me as being a more likely than any time since the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1963. So I would imagine that, uh, that we have to be quite careful about how we uh, react to the more authoritarian Russia, as well as pushing back on it because, of, because of, we see our principles as being different. But, uh, you know, so I, I think, as I say, it depends upon, you know, your, your, your own sort of personal philosophies as to how you answer that question, perhaps. So this is all from the Q&A session. And now I request Dr. Masuma Hassan, Chairperson of the Pakistan Institute of International Affairs, to present the note of thanks. Can you hear me, Bushra? Yes, ma'am, I can hear you. Well, I know that uh, there are a few other questions we haven't really uh, turned to, and some, some of our participants uh, would have wanted to say something, but we are running out of time. We've only got a few minutes left. So unfortunately, I will have to wrap up. And I will say my lines. I've got another chance to say my lines. Um, I want to respond to what Shah Rukh Shah Nawaz said about some unfinished business. I think he's right. Because you know, the Humudur Rahman Commission report did issue a charge sheet. But nothing was done about it. Uh, it was, the report was with Mr. Bhutto, but nothing was done about it because I think the primary consideration at that time was to build up the morale of the returning uh, army, and especially those who were being repatriated. They had had a terrible time in, in Indian camps as prisoners of war. Also, the civil internees also didn't really relish living over there as prisoners of war. So that was probably the consideration that nothing was done about it, but it was a charge sheet. Uh, the report is there for anybody to read. It's a voluminous report. Uh, it has a lot of backup material, which is obviously not published. I want to thank everybody Sonia, James, uh, Shahrukh. Uh, I'm so glad you came on, Shahrukh, uh, for, for attending this, uh, this webinar. Uh, you know, this is a, a very important day in, in the lives of our country. And uh, such days are important in the, in the lives of many disintegrated countries. So next year, when it will be 50 years since uh, our country fell apart and Bangladesh is, uh, was created, uh, we will have a bigger occasion uh, in which maybe we can have a live conference by that time if COVID is behind us, mm -hmm. uh, we can have a live conference. Uh, I did ask a question which uh, um, Bushra uh, did not pose and that is about reconciliation I asked Sonia whether what were the prospects of reconciliation between the constituent units of constituent countries in former Yugoslavia, because we are still seeking, still looking forward to, still hoping that there will be a reconciliation between Bangladesh and Pakistan. We all hope for that. I feel that 